Hi, I'm Danny Barta. I'm a paleontologist and graduate of the Richard Gilder Graduate School at AMNH. I am currently an assistant professor at the Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences. I study the growth of dinosaurs and other fossil reptiles. I look at the microscopic structure of their bones to figure out how fast they grew and how old they were when they died. Studies like this have revealed a lot about the metabolism and life history of many species. I hope you enjoy the watch party, and I'll be answering your questions about pterosaurs and dinosaurs in the chat. When people first started to find pterosaurs and they were studied by early paleontologists, they really didn't know what to make out of them. Some people thought that they were aquatic animals that used their wings to propel themselves through the water. It wasn't until the 1840s or so that people really started to recognize them for what they were, a distinct group of flying reptiles that are unrelated to birds or bats. They were the earliest creatures to have powered flight. They had a life of about 175 million years, which is a long, long time. And they've seemed to have populated the entire planet. Pterosaurs are such a diverse group of animals and so different from anything else that you have today. Perhaps the most interesting aspect that might surprise the visitors is to see so much variation in body shapes, and in size of those really fascinating animals called pterosaurs. In the last decade, we've probably seen more new pterosaurs found around the world than in the previous history of pterosaur studies in general. The pterosaur fossils that have recently been found in Brazil and in China are a lot different than pterosaur fossils that are known from other parts of the world specifically the ones from China, because they preserve so much soft tissue information. Instead of just bones, we have wing membranes, we have little filaments that look like primitive feathers. Pterosaurs clearly inspire us in ways that few other animals do. Something about large flying reptiles from a distant past, I think kind of feels like aliens to us. But they were real animals, and that makes them all the more fascinating. I don't think anybody sees a pterosaur, whether a paleontologist, child, adult, they look at one and they just think it's a really strange looking animal and they want to know more about it. Pterosaurs are not classified as birds, and they are also not dinosaurs. They're an extinct group of flying reptiles that are more closely related to dinosaurs and birds than they are to any other kind of reptile. Pterosaurs first appear about 225 million years ago and become extinct at the same time the non-avian dinosaurs did about 65 million years ago. There are two broad categories of pterosaur body plan. Earlier pterosaurs tended to have long tails, relatively short heads, and relatively short limbs. The later pterosaurs tended to have very short tails, longer limbs when standing on the ground, and very large heads and necks. In recent years, there have been several trackways that have been found and that we could refer to pterosaurs. And the main reason for that is because pterosaurs have a particular morphology of their hands and their feet, and you could see them replicated in those trackways. And those trackways showed us that they moved on the ground using all four limbs. Pterosaur research is an ongoing process and we have a lot of new discoveries and a lot of new aspects that we might learn in the future. Many people think that pterosaurs are dinosaurs because they're reptiles and they lived at the same time as dinosaurs, but pterosaurs are not actually dinosaurs in the scientific sense. So when we call something a dinosaur, we mean that it belongs to the group Dinosauria, which was named by Sir Richard Owen in 1842. 
And within Dinosauria, there's three main groups. You have the Ornithischian dinosaurs, like Triceratops and Stegosaurus, and you have the long-necked sauropod dinosaurs, like Patagotitan or Apatosaurus, and you also have the theropod dinosaurs, which includes the very famous Tyrannosaurus, as well as our birds that we see all around us today. So when we think about biological classification, each group is nested within a larger group. Dinosauria is nested within a larger group called Archosauria. Archosauria includes the close cousins of the dinosaurs, the pterosaurs that we talked about earlier, as well as the crocodile line archosaurs, which includes today's crocodiles and alligators, as well as a number of extinct forms, some of whom actually were dinosaur mimics. You may have even seen extinct crocodilians in a museum and thought they were dinosaurs because they look so similar. Pterosaurs and dinosaurs are distinguished from all of the crocodile line archosaurs on the basis of the arrangement of their ankle bones. Dinosaurs and pterosaurs separated from one another nearly 250 million years ago on the basis of having a hole in their hip socket and a long crest on their upper arm bone. 250 million years ago is really a very long time geologically, so dinosaurs and pterosaurs, while they may be close cousins in an evolutionary sense, are really quite widely separated. Now there are flying dinosaurs, uh, we just call them birds today. Many other prehistoric animals often get confused with dinosaurs, like the sail-backed mammal relative Dimetrodon, as well as fossil mammals themselves, the giant ground sloth or woolly mammoth. People also think sometimes that large marine reptiles like plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and mosasaurs are dinosaurs themselves. You may think that an animal is a dinosaur because it's large and scaly, but these traits evolved much earlier in evolutionary history. Just because pterosaurs aren't dinosaurs doesn't make them any less amazing. They ruled the skies for over 150 million years, and I think that's really cool. Nyctos Nystosaurus Nyctosaurus Jeholeop Jeho Jeholopter Jeholoroptus Jeholopterus Prion Pr Pronodactylus Prendoact 
Dactylus. Crayon Dactylus. Quids. Quetzalcoatlus. Quetzalcoatlus. Tape. Tapajara. Tapajara. Thalassodrin. Thalass. Oh, Thalassodromias. Thalassodromias. Pterodostro. 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 Tupandactylus. 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 Wukong gate. Wukongopterus. Wukongopterus. Pteranodon. Pteran. Pteran. Pteranodon. Pteranodon. Long before there were pterosaurs, insects were the only powered flyers on Earth. Vertebrates, animals with backbones, are much heavier than insects. Weight is the most obvious challenge to flight. Over 200 million years ago, the first vertebrates to overcome the challenge and achieve powered flight were pterosaurs. The adaptations that allowed them to fly can help describe how the forces of flight work and interact. Pterosaur species range from swift, small flyers like Jaelopterus to massive creatures like Quetzalcoatlus, the largest known flying creature of all time. How could Quetzalcoatlus, estimated to have stood nearly 16 feet tall, have launched into the air and flown? One adaptation is in their bones. Pterosaur bones were hollow, with extremely thin walls. Internal struts reinforced the bones, so they were lightweight, yet strong. Pterosaurs had another, special adaptation, the way they launched. Powerful front and hind limbs allowed Quetzalcoatlus to take off into the air in an explosive split second. Perhaps the most important adaptation that allowed pterosaurs to fly is this, the shape of their wings. Pterosaur wings are thicker in front, the part that faces the direction of travel. It's how air flows around this shape that generates lift. Much later in Earth's history, birds and bats independently evolved this same wing shape. Aircraft designers call this shape a cambered airfoil. In a wind tunnel, jets of air allow us to see what's usually invisible. Air as a fluid medium that flows around anything in its path. The air moves faster over the top of the airfoil compared to the underside. That's because the airfoil shape and angle force the air to spin into vortices on the wing. The spinning air makes the air on top move faster, and the air on the underside move slower, creating a pressure difference. It's the pressure difference between the upper and lower air that generates lift. For every airfoil shape and speed, there's an angle of attack that provides the most effective lift. Of course, pterosaurs didn't fly in wind tunnels. Pterosaurs and other animal flyers flap their wings and adjust their angle of attack during flight. Most of the resulting lift goes to holding up their weight, but a small portion also helps to thrust themselves forward. How often would pterosaurs have had to flap their wings? In part, that depends on how much air resistance or drag they encountered. Large pterosaurs, like large birds today, would tire out after a few minutes of flapping. Long, narrow wings are an adaptation that reduces drag. Large birds can take breaks from flapping by soaring on rising thermals of air or by gliding on strong ocean winds. By taking advantage of these outside sources of lift, Larger pterosaurs could have traveled long distances at high speeds.
Lighter weight pterosaurs, like J. Holopterus, could afford stouter wings. They would have flapped more frequently, but they had much greater control over their speed and direction. In any environment, powered flight has to achieve a balance between weight, lift, thrust, and drag. Flapping wings thrust an animal forward and counteract drag. The forward motion displaces air around the wing. Almost all of the resulting lift goes to counteracting the animal's weight. Flying takes a lot of energy. Why did pterosaurs do it? Flight provides an escape from predators, new ways to catch prey. Flight widens the range for finding food and mates. As the first vertebrate flyers, pterosaurs were incredibly successful. They lived for over 150 million years and diversified into many species that were adapted to their unique habitats. The last pterosaurs became extinct about 66 million years ago. No one will ever see a pterosaur alive. But as we find more pterosaur fossils and apply powerful new techniques for interpreting data, we can develop new theories about how pterosaurs lived and were adapted for flight. Because of the fragility of the pterosaur skeleton, there aren't many pterosaur fossils that are found. Pterosaurs have incredibly fragile hollow bones. I can say that after you know, 25 years of collecting fossils in the Gobi Desert, every single summer, we've collected thousands of dinosaurs. I've found one pterosaur bone in that entire time. A lot of pterosaur discovery is just serendipity. Some of the first pterosaurs to be discovered were discovered by quarrymen and limestone quarries in Solnhofen in southern Germany. Despite the fact that you do find pterosaurs in all continents, over 90% of all pterosaur specimens and about 50% of all pterosaur diversity only come from five deposits. So even if you find pterosaurs in different places, their preservation is very poor and in only five places you really have enough specimens to be able to reconstruct the whole animal and to have a better insight about their diversity. Because pterosaur fossils are so rare, every single new discovery adds to this body of knowledge that we know about. I think that there was probably thousands of different pterosaur species. We only have 150 right now. I always wanted to become a paleontologist and believe it or not, I always wanted to study those flying creatures called pterosaurs. For me, the most fun aspect of my work is actually to find fossils. When you make this discovery and you find those bones that are buried for millions of years and you are the first one to see them, that is a fantastic feeling. In a way, I started my job today as a paleontologist as a kid. I went searching for fossils and cool creatures out in the woods and cliffs and deserts. And I just spent a lot of time reading as much as I could about the animals that fascinated me. Just like with all other fossils, recent advances in technology have really changed the way that we're able to study pterosaurs. And some of these things are things like cat scanning, which we can accurately reconstruct their brains. We can even look at some of the mechanical aspects on the inside of their bones. We can also use computer simulations to be able to look at pterosaur flight. So in the same way that people modeled the wings of airplanes, we can use some of those same techniques to look at the flight performance of pterosaurs. My favorite pterosaur fossils that I've ever had the opportunity to study are some of the Anahangurid fossils, specifically Jeholopterus from northeastern China. It's a beautiful small specimen. It's completely covered with filamentous texture, so it's like a fuzz ball flying through the air when it was alive. It has wings which show that it was probably a very agile flyer and an animal that might be very similar to a modern bat. My favorite pterosaur would have to be Quetzalcoatlus. The largest individual of Quetzalcoatlus, Quetzalcoatlus northropi, was one of the largest flying animals of all time, which is very impressive and raises a number of interesting scientific questions. 
I think my favorite pterosaur is Tupandactylus imperator. And the main reason for that is when I first saw that specimen with that huge crest, I didn't believe it existed. And still now I keep wondering, how did that animal fly? Thank you for asking so many good questions and thanks for watching. The AMNH hosts live watch parties every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time on our YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe to get notified about future live watch parties.